God, open our minds and our hearts to receive your word, dear God, and help us that uh, if it requires that we may change our thinking, change our ways, uh, that you would guide us in that direction, dear God. We pray for Clem and, and Alvin, who was missing with us today, that you would uh, be with them and bless them and keep them, dear God. Continue to be with us and provide and uh, bless us all um, to our, today and the rest of this week. Please mercy be asked in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Well, it is indeed my distinguished pleasure to be with you again. It's a wonderful thing to come together in this manner, and uh, I'm grateful that we can share the word, especially as we talk about the end time prophecy. I'm trying to um, see what this says. Okay. Uh, so we have been uh, dealing with the seventh seal and the sanctuary. Hopefully you are able to see that something blocking it there. But uh, <clears throat> by way of review, it is taken from Revelation chapter, or well, chapters five, four, five, and it continues six, seven, all the way through. Because what we will discover is that when the book, that book, is open, we will be seeing all the things, and especially the seven period, the seven seals really means seven period of our salvation that, that we will look into. So, um, they will eventually be open and that the opening of the book is in chapter, chapter 6. And that's why I'm saying now, we even have to go to Matthew chapter 20 because it's the only book that has an explanation for something that will come up in one of the seals. Uh, you may remember the wine and the oil and the penny a day. Well, the only chapter that brings that out is Matthew chapter 20. So there's a parable in Matthew chapter 20 that one of, one of the time in this series we'll have to go to Matthew chapter 20 and maybe take a couple of evenings to cover it. Then we can get back on track. So I'm going to well, I'm going to just take the picture and all of us will review what chapter 6, chapters 4 and 5 really bring out. Then, after we've done that review, I will pick up where I left off. So, let me just start. John saw a door open in heaven. And we discussed that, we said the only door that is closed, uh, that it was, was closed for centuries, um, we know that by way of what on earth. What did we, how did we find out what door was closed and therefore that is the door that was open in heaven? Anybody remembers? Okay, the only door that is closed is the door to the most holy apartment. Yeah, and it is a sanctuary um, lesson that actually allows us to really come to that conclusion from the Bible. So, 
when we have the foundation of this sanctuary, we're able to unlock a lot of stuff. Okay, so what did we say this proceeding was? You remember? You mean the this, this, yeah, this picture. What did we say? To oh. These were the 24 elders. Um, yes. Around the throne. Yeah, but what the whole proceeding, what is that mean? One oh, word. One, to, uh, one word. Investigative judgment. Amen. It is an investigative judgment. And so, just like our courtroom on earth, it is the same way, just that it has, where we have 12 jurors, we have 24 and the participants in this, except for the, the um, 24 elders, which we know, we, it is obvious that we have the other members. Who are those? You can always look in your Bible because we're going to have to read it again. Uh, but we just want to jog your memory. We have the judge, which is God himself, and there, of course, is like sardine stone, and uh, there's a bright light, and then the, we have a candlestick, which tells us again that it is in the sanctuary. Um, <clears throat> now, the rainbow, do you remember what we said the rainbow was? God's covenant. Yes, it is covenant, and we read a few things where it says it is promise of mercy and his love. And somebody was mentioning that people sort of misused it. But we know that today we have a lot of blasphemy. You know, <clears throat> there's a Seventh-day Adventist church that one morning they discovered that somebody went inside there and defecate on the on the restroom. Uh. Yes. So God is so merciful and people are taking advantage of that but Mom get that light for me please. Thank you. Um so We can, people are doing a lot of things and taking chances, using the rainbow, as you said, and all that, but, and that's why it says it's God's covenant and it is the emblem of His mercy and so on. What else did we talk about? Anybody have anything you want to say? Uh, if you have any question regarding what we discussed, because this is this is the most critical subject right now, as we stand here or sit here. <coughs> this light out here, there. Um, it is a judgment. Um, so. It is centered around what? Or whom? Jesus Christ. Yes, and what is, represent, is being represented as? The lamb that was slain. A slain lamb. So, we have the judge, we have the jury, and we have God's covenant, or His promise, to assure us that everything will go well here. And of course we have four beasts. Who knows who, what these beasts are representing? Well, what is missing there then? What is, look in a courtroom on earth and tell me what would be missing if we have the judge, the jury, and we have... Then you'll have the, 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 the prosecutor and the, um, you know, the, the, the two... 
two lawyers against each other or something like that? <laughs> Defend that. Ah, oh, yes, we have. It. So, yes, yeah, well, the two lawyers, whether or not the, the, the lawyer. <laughs> The lawyer that is defending us here, defending these defendants, uh, because it's a, it's a symbol of us, as we have seen, because they, uh, and I'll ask that question, because it, it will help to, to, to sort of cement it. We have our advocate, our lawyer, on this side of the, the defense. Who would be the lawyer of those who don't choose Christ? Peter. Oh! <laughs> so, but the thing is, he can't be there. He, he, he doesn't, he, I mean, he doesn't need to be there, really. He doesn't need to be there. He was kicked out, and God knows that he doesn't, because his defense <coughs> doesn't matter, really. Um, okay, any question on that? Because we're going to read again. It makes sense to read this again, and then, so... If so, not... Yes, go ahead. So the, the, the four beasts uh, rep would represent the, the, the beast in uh, Revelation, right? For the most part? Well, these four beasts in the judgment are representing us, people on earth, the defendants. Okay. Yes. So we cannot be there personally, but mm -hmm. we are there. And let me just show you quickly and we'll go over them. Because the beast, if you notice, they are seen... They are given four different heads, and four is the four compass of the earth. That's the number four is for that. Now, they are given some appropriate heads. Why? Because they are representing all the redeemed. That's what we read in chapter 5, verse 8, and we'll go back to it. Is that both the beast and the Elders praise God and says and say, You have redeemed us. You remember that? From the earth by your blood. And so, because, well, we have the head of a lion, the head of a calf, the head of a man, the head of an eagle. Oh, the head of the lion, since the lion is the king of the beast, and the bird is the eagle is the king of birds, the lions start out with the with, with, with the with Abraham. I mean not Abraham, with Adam. Adam the first man, because the judgment here involves every man from all the dead beginning with Adam to the end of time. So this would represent the period of Adam come right down to the time when the people were sacrificing um, calves. They couldn't use a lamb because Christ is already in the form of a lamb. And then this calf really, all that period stretches all the way down to the Christian dispensation that is represented by the head of a man and so all the people in the Christian era is represented under, under this beast. And then after, right to the end, where we are going to have the translation of both the dead and the living. Because when Christ comes, the people will come up from the grave. And those who, are, who did not die will go, will be translated. And they will be changed from mortal into immortality. So the eagle is representing that last period of all the people on earth. Okay, let's quickly read and then we go to where we left off. I think we left off where we were to go on the beast or something. I'll find it. 
Revelation 4 and 5. Let's just go through it again so you can refresh your memory. Anybody has it? Do you want us to read through Revelation 4 and 5? Yes. Um, so, okay. I'm beginning, to, huh? I'm beginning to end or what? I'm yeah, just, let's read the two chapters quickly. What's that? It's, it's pretty... After this, huh? I mean, it's pretty short, so just to keep our minds. Alright. After this, I look and behold a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as if it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up thither, and I will show you these things. I will show you, I will show thee things which must be thereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set up in heaven, and one that sat on the throne and one that sat on the throne, and he that sat up, sat, was to look upon like a, like a jasper and a sardis stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, the sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty elders, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had in their hands crowns of gold, and they, and they had in their head, on their head, crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightning and thundering and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of, in the, midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the fourth beast was like a lion. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth was like a, a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not there nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that, oh, and when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who lived forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat upon the throne and worshiped him, him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. All right. Okay. I will pick up on five, but in a minute. Let's look at the, the beast then, since, and you can remind me if that's not where we reach, but that's what I have in my notes here. We dealt with a candlestick. Remember what we said the candlestick is? And somebody had asked a question, because what the candlestick says is that there is a seven spirit. <coughs> now, and we discover that, no, it's not seven spirits, but the seven is just the number that tells us that the Church of God, in spite of uh, martyrdom, persecution, and whatever, God's Church is always so the seven lamps burning before the throne day and night because there's no windows in the sanctuary and as a matter of fact it was designed for that purpose the lamp stand is showing that we as God's people 
have been given given all the truth from Adam the light of God's word has come to us in every generation and that's what the <coughs> the lampstand is describing <coughs> now any question on that? I think we, that it's pretty clear. Yeah, I think you had mentioned that the seven uh, was also uh, a sign of the perfection of God's spirit. Yes, it's symbolic, the, the, the perfect number. The it's, completion of God's spirit. Yes, it's a perfect number. And it means, and seven is, is uh, number that is stand for that stands for perfection amen anything else all right so we go to the beast and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him chapter 4 verse 9 that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne, and worshipped him, that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before him, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are <coughs> and were created. <coughs> oh. Okay, so we have passed this. We have passed the door. And we've passed the judge, who is the judge, God the Father, and the jury. <coughs> so we are going to look at the four beasts. The four beasts, let me see if I pass them. Therefore, well, maybe I pass it. The beast and elders. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. Well, <clears throat> you notice that I underscore which are the prayers of the saints. If it says they have a container with prayers, that is a, giving us a hint also that these prayer, prayers were prayed already. They were, right? They were not prayers that were being prayed. As you know, people are praying every day. But if it says that they have a vial with order, and which are the prayers of saints, it is telling us that it's talking about the dead. Because only the dead righteous would have prayed, but we know that the, the prayers and the sacrifices, all of that was credited to this sanctuary in heaven. What was done on earth was credited to heaven until Christ would have opened that door and entered the most holy apartment to cleanse it from all the sins. And <clears throat> so that is why 
that is saying that. Any question, any comment? But am I to understand that when you say the prayers of the saints? Does yes. Does that mean our prayers are saved in heaven? Yes. All our prayers? Yes, all our prayers. As a matter of fact, everything that we do is recorded daily. An angel is constantly taking record of all the things that we do and it's written even if we pray the same things over and over again yes right. yes yes okay. and you see there's nothing wrong with praying the same prayer over and over um, you know there are times that you you need to do more if you are studying God's Word because as you are educated in the Word you see more things which you need to um, pray about but um, so only in that context your your rhetorical your question that is just recurring um, prayer only in that that manner it is um, it is not encouraged because you, once you are reading, you wouldn't have the same prayer over and over and over. But at the same time, yes. Any other input there? Well, let's continue to read. Huh? Have something? Yeah, no, go ahead. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open it. So you notice this now. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. So the book also is sealed with how many seals? Seven, seven. And those seven seals are depicting seven periods of our earth history. And we are in one of those seals. So that's how God has done it. So when that is broken, we will be able to see what Christ only can reveal. And John would have written it and we will be able to read it and know what happened there, what happened here. Now, as they were in the judgment, as, because I said the judgment is a foundation, as they were in the judgment, they also opened the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets also will take us back to the beginning and show us the destruction, the plagues. We're heading for a time when there will be seven last plagues. But the seven trumpets will show us individual period. Just as it is marked with a seal, it is marked with judgment or a plague. And why is that? Well, let's take um, Noah for example. God sends a message to the people through Noah. And Noah delivered the message. Now, God never destroyed anybody without warning, giving them ample time, ample enough information to know how to deal with the situation that we are living in and the time we are dealing with. And so <clears throat> we will see that the message in every generation, even ours, I have to constantly remind us of this, is the only thing that will stand as a witness, you know in court you must have a witness. 
is the light that shines on your path. The last thing that you see. You can't be judged by what now people, the message of now. You can't even be judged by what the disciples preached. You have to be judged by the message of today, the message of the hour. Or sealed. So the message comes and you get the revelation. It's your duty to check it out. And the angels will take record and whatever is written in the book. Because remember, when Christ left, he sent what? Whom? Comforter. The Holy Spirit, in the Comforter. And he would do what? Lead us into all truth. All truth means that what some get, got before is not necessarily what you get. It's meat in due season. And he does not give any one person all the truth. So as we go through this, and since we're dealing with the judgment, I'd just like to emphasize that it is a message. So right now, it is this message that will defend you. It will defend your character or it will condemn you and me. That's exactly the, because it's the message of the hour. The judgment hour message, which is now going through the dead. The names are being investigated. And if there is forgiveness, because as, you, as we talk about the prayer, the prayers are those things that cancels out, like, like repentance. You repent of a sin and you pray about it. Because God is not forcing anyone to. He gives you free will to curse him out. He said, even if he, he knew that people will curse him and blaspheme him, but he gives them free will just the same. That's, how, that's the God we serve. All right. Any question? Any comment? Yeah, I have a question. So, yeah. if um, you know your sins are, are being reported for the most part, and you confess your sins, does that mean that the record, your record, is clear for that time, or you know, or are? Well, your record, your record, the record is there. It's not clear until. Your name it comes up and the sanctuary is cleansed of sin because your sin is mounted there. Okay. So your name <clears throat> and your sin go hand in hand. All the good things that you do are being recorded too. And therefore you can you can we can be doing all the atrocities, all the cursing, all the killing, the stealing, com committing adultery, what not sin. But when your name comes up, you have one good. And the good you have is that you were sorry for our sins and we confess. That one good can wipe away all your bad and vice versa. You could be doing the best, being the best Christian throughout your life. But you deliberately sin and refuse to repent. That one sin can wipe your record clean of all the good you do and condemn you to death. And that means the names will be blotted out of the book. And, <clears throat> but if, if you confess your sin, the, your name will be imprinted. <laughs> you know, it is it's like, it is there, but now it, it will be sneered in, it will, 
it will be burnt in All right, so we're looking at this. And they sung a new song, saying, <clears throat> Thou art worthy. Watch this now. Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us. Right? Who are talking here? Who are saying all this? <coughs> all right, let, let me show you who are saying this. Go up here, go up to the top and read that line. <coughs> and when he has taken the book, the four beasts, the four, 24 elders fell down before the land. Now, between heaven one of of them harps and golden veils full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. Go on, so, go on, and, and, and it's a continue, go on. They sung a new song, saying that thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to, to God by the blood. Was. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, finish it. And town and people and nations. Uh, note to the beast that the elders are saying, For thou hast redeemed us out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. So, this is the evidence, this is the biblical evidence that the beast and the elders are earthly beings because no other people were redeemed by the blood of Christ on the earth. On fallen world? No. So where did these elders and beasts and the beasts, the, now you see that the beasts are not beasts but they are people. They are only beasts because, and the reason why God uses beasts is because if you go back to Daniel you will notice that in Daniel 7, he used, he's consistent. He used a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a nondescript beast to describe the first or the ancient civilized world. The lion was the period of Babylon, the empire, but the world, the, the, the system also meaning the people, all right? So, it is not strange for the Bible to use beasts to represent people. Because when you go to Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 2 has the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. What did he dream? Anybody remember? Because he, he couldn't interpret the dream. But Daniel interpreted for him a statue. A statue. And what was the statue built of? Different types of metal, gold, oh. silver, bronze. Yes. Then it had feet of clay. Uh -huh. clay. Iron and clay. Iron. Iron. And leg of iron and feet of iron and clay. So it starts at the head. Babylon was the head of gold. Then the next power that was predicted to overthrow Babylon was an inferior because silver is second in power to gold in value. And so when he was told that, what did he do? Did he build a, a statue like that? No. no, what did he build? A statue of pure gold. A statue of pure gold because he defied that um, statement that God told him through Daniel. Alright, so that was just to sort of reinforce our 
or confirm the point that these beasts are representing us and all other from, as it says, kindred tongues and people and nations. And you'll find that in Revelation 5, 8 and 9. All right. Uh, I'll come back to that all right we're doing dealing with the beast now in terms of the descriptions um, <clears throat> verse 8 if you have your Bible look on that or look on the screen verse 8 of chapter 4 Read it again. Verse 8. Yeah. And, and the four beasts had each of them six wings above him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day nor night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. All right. So, we discover that the beasts are people, so now we have to unlock the meaning of their descriptions. Why is it that these beasts had wings, full of eyes, and all the rest of it? And the eyes were just two eyes like you and I, they have eyes before, behind, all over. Well, let's take the wings. Therefore, they stand as a symbol. Go ahead. Somebody saying something? Uh, no, no, go ahead. They stand as a symbol signifying that God's people have had sufficient light, sufficient light um, <coughs> let me see if I have this scripture here <coughs> go to the next slide <coughs> just as I was explaining that God's church is shining in every dispensation from beginning to end. It is confirming right here now that we as people have been given enough, enough revelation, enough spiritual light. The Word of God is described as light. Now the eyes, our eyes, are the lights to our body. Right? So it allows us to see, to shine those things inward, so we know what we are looking at. So you imagine that we are described as having eyes before and behind. What do you think that is saying? Again, it is saying that God's people have had sufficient light in every age. Before and behind denotes prophetic light revealing to them the past, the present, and the future. You recall when Christ comes, came, and he was the first time, and he was explaining to his disciples what he did he went back to Moses and he showed the prophecy that related to himself and his crucifixion and his suffering all the way up and so 
we here today are challenged to do the same. We here today are required to do the same. Because if we don't know our past, we are quite unlikely to understand the present. And so that's the evidence that God is giving us. Whether we want to deny that is up to us. But God has given, uh, is showing that His people who is judging, who is before the bar of heaven at this time, has had enough, have had enough that could save their souls. Enough instructions reveal to them the past, the present, the future. This being made possible by the Spirit of God and by the holy angels. <clears throat> Any question on that? All right, number four. Uh, we talk about this already, what four is showing, because there are four be Number four shows that there are four classes of saints to be considered in the judgment. Two of these classes are to be resurrected, namely those who died naturally and those who were martyred. The other two are they who shall be translated at the coming of Christ, namely the 144,000 of Revelation 7, 1 to 8, and a great multitude with palms in their hands, that should be saying, with palms in their hands, as shown in Revelation 7, and verse 9. So, any question on that? Who will be comprised the 144,000? Israelites. And that's a subject that we will, <laughs> if we have time, when we, we will get to it. But just as the Bible says, one, twelve, thousand from each of the tribes of Israel and it is not ancient Israel is the descendant where you the possibility you have the blood of the Jew you are a descendant and you are recipient to be among the one forty four thousand so God, God will guide you into the message of the hour, and because we have modern, we have ancient Israel, and we also have modern Israel. And let me clear up something here: the Jews, who many of us believe are the Israelites, are only representing two tribes. When God said 12 tribes, he meant the 10 tribes that were dispersed throughout the world in 721 BC under the, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, under the king of Assyria who is called Sennacherib. He invaded the, uh, the Israelites because you know that the Israelites were divided under the rulership of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And so two tribes went to his son and Ten tribes went to his servants, and so they, they were in two different areas. Up north you have <coughs> the ten tribes, and down south you have 
the two tribes with Jerusalem and Samaria as their capital. So when you hear about Samaria, you're talking about the ten tribes. That ten, the majority, was dispersed among the nations. But God today will find their descendants among us. We are. Once we get the message, once we have the message that God sends at this time, especially the three angels' message, we are modern Israel and likely to be among the one four four thousand. Spiritual Jews. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Israel, twelve tribes. The Jews is only two tribes. But Judah and Benjamin. But um, when it says Israel, it's talking about twelve tribes. All right. So, <clears throat> as we look at that, let's move on. Now we talk about the wings. <clears throat> How many wings do these beasts have? <clears throat> How many Six. wings? Six each, right? <clears throat> Is it six each? Six wings? Okay, six wings. Okay. Six wings each. Yeah. each. Each, right? Is that correct? They are pointed six. I'm asking you. Is it six wings each? Six uh, each, yes. Yes. That's right. Six wings each. All right. So, what's the purpose of wings? To fly. Oh, to fly, yes. But do you ever see a lion fly? No. Okay. See them leap, but not fly. They leap, but not fly. So, obviously, it is unnatural. And so, therefore, it is representing something other than flying. And, well, we could, we could use fly when we get into it, but not the fly as we do. We could use fly, but just time, because they are really showing time. Yes. They are really showing time. And that's why I say you can you can say time flies, right? <laughs> time flies. So I wouldn't rule out that type of fly, but that's the only fly they can fly, time. The six wings are really six periods. So, actually the judgment, they are showing us, they are telling us that the judgment began under the sixth seal. And therefore, we today are living under number six seal. Isn't that scary? Is that scary or is it scary? Not scary. Yeah. It's what it is. <laughs> yeah. We are living under the sixth seal. That's what the beasts are telling us. And the judgment begun under the sixth seal. So <coughs> we, we know that because of the period of time that has passed already? Yes, we know that, yes. And we will see that when the book is open, it will show us the individual period. And when we go through the different symbols in that period, we will see that it fits X, Y, or Z period of time. So we are in the sixth seal, and only one is left. One. We are in the sixth seal. Because the sixth seal began 
1755, which we will see. All right, 17, uh, yes. All right, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll have evidence for that, no worry. So, as the wings of the lion and also the four-headed le leopard beast, um, Babylon and Greece represent numbers of periods, then they must stand for the same on these beasts. They are to point out the seal under which the judgment begun. Seal number six, therefore six wings. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That's what they say. Now here's a chart that depicts our world history. It's found in Daniel and Revelation. If you were to read <clears throat> from Daniel chapter 7, you will see Babylon just as the image corresponding with the image because why God used the different symbols to bring out the same point. One is that what one fails to reveal, the other does. And in other words, one symbol is not capable of bringing out uh, a comprehensive view of what we are looking at. For example, if the head of gold is representing the king, would that tell us about anything else? Like the empire? No, right? It just tell us about the king. You are the head of gold. You, one man, the king, Nebuchadnezzar. So, while this is his dream, and it is interesting that God put this dream in a king that we would class as a heathen king, right? So, we can't fathom God. He used Nebuchadnezzar, he put the dream in him, but he, he used his prophet to reveal it. And we say from time to time, God uses his prophet to bring out the secret in his word. That, you know, we just, we just can't go and, and find God's secret. Even though you might read it, read it, read it, you won't see it until you consult with God's prophet. That's why we have the spirit of prophecy, a great controversy. So, it is, a, it is a history of the world. History and prophecy go hand in hand. And so when the, when the prophecy um, prophesied, and then it is fulfilled, we will see that the fulfilled prophecy becomes history. And so that's why they go hand in hand like twin. So the beginning of time from Adam would be found here, beginning of the world. And then as we travel on this line up to 20, 4,000 B.C., uh, 2,400 B.C., sorry. We would find it after the flood that it will start another period called Babylon. And then Babylon and then Babylon, which is the head of gold, depicted as a, as a lion, would be overthrown by an inferior beast, which is a bear, 